This is your England's Colonization of America Chesapeake lecture. The objectives for this lecture are the following. To understand why England came to America and why the English colonies formed the way they did. To understand the cultural, economical, social, and political development of the Chesapeake colony. Be able to compare the cultural, economical, social, and political development of the Chesapeake colony to the New England colony. To understand the roles that culture, environment, and interaction with the Native Americans played in the Chesapeake colony. And to understand ideas of freedom in the Chesapeake colony. Before I discuss the Chesapeake Colony specifically, I want to briefly talk about England's colonization of America in general. So why the English colonies in America formed the way they did. First, because of the decline of the Spanish Empire. Second, because of the Protestant Reformation. Third, because of rivalry and competition among European nations. And fourth, because of overpopulation of England. During the 16th century, it was the golden age of Spain. Spain was considered the wealthiest nation. And it was ruled by Charles V this guy right here. Charles V also ruled the Holy Roman Empire and the Spanish Empire was within the realm of the Holy Roman Empire. Charles V ruled from 1516 to 1566. He strengthened and consolidated his empire. He was also Catholic and Spain, for a number of years, had profited from forced labor, specifically the Native American slaves who worked in the gold and silver mines. And I mentioned this in the early conquest lecture. So this is how an imp imperial empire works. In order to control your empire, you need a sophisticated bureaucracy and incentive. You also need people to rule over, and you need those people to be happy and well-fed, otherwise they might revolt. And Charles was successful at this for a while, but eventually a problem occurred. Gold and silver from the Americas, specifically Mexico and Peru, declined. This caused the Spanish Empire to go into an economic decline. As a result, the Spanish Empire lost power. In addition to this, Charles had an appetite for war. And he was a very confident man. This led him to be very aggressive with other European nation rivals. But wars cost a lot of money. And they cost the empire a lot of money. And this created a national debt. So what do you do when you have a national debt? You tax the people that you rule. And that is what Charles V did. He taxed his subjects. This ultimately bankrupted Spain. Because Spain was bankrupt, this will also cause a decline in Spain's power, specifically their power to rule in the Americas the Spanish Empire became weak. And because they didn't have money, and because they didn't have power, this also caused a decline in the exploration and settlement in the Americas. In addition to the Spanish Empire's economic decline, they also declined because of increasing competition from other nations. Other nations were aggressive against Spain. The English colonies also formed the way they did because of the Protestant Reformation. 
Europeans were unified as Catholics by the Catholic Church. However, in early 16th century, this Catholic unity was shattered. And it was shattered by a man by the name of Martin Luther from Germany in 1517. Luther believed that the Catholic Church needed improvement. He thought that the Catholic Church was wrong. He thought that individuals could interpret the Bible for themselves and not just the elite. At the time, the Bible was only written in Latin, so only the educated elite could read it. Most people were not educated. They had to rely on the elite's interpretation of the Bible. But Luther did his own interpretation of the Bible and made it available to the masses. And in 1540, Henry VIII had the idea that he could break from the Catholic Church. And the reason he did this is because he wanted to annul the marriage of Catherine of Aragon because they had not had any male heirs. So Henry VIII became Anglican and became a head of state and head of the church. The chief tenets of Protestantism are that Protestants rejected the authority of the Pope, that faith is more important than ritual, and what you do in the world is more important. And Protestantism is developing at the same time as America is being colonized. One of the early leaders of Protestantism was John Calvin. He had followers in France, Scotland, and the Netherlands. He also believed in predestination. And predestination was an idea that God willed eternal damnation for some and salvation for others. In other words, there was no free will. So when you were born, you were either damned or you were saved. But you didn't know which. So you had to do good works to be in God's good graces to make sure that you were saved. They also believed in an angry God and in sin. Another reason why the English colonies formed the way they did was because of wealth, power, and competition. England wanted to be more powerful and make money for the crown. This would help build an empire so they could rival Spain and France. This would also help alleviate dependence on foreigners for consumer goods. It was their idea of freedom. If you remember, I mentioned in the early conquest lecture that England, which was part of Europe, was underdeveloped and was dependent on other nations. And finally, why the English colonies in America formed the way they did was because of overpopulation. America served as a place to alleviate overpopulation in England. In 1550, there were 3 million, and it jumped up to 4 million in 1600. There was no room to expand. England was a small country. Their economic system couldn't support such a population. A quarter of their people were starving, and they had a high death rate. Because of overpopulation of the cities, the high population in the cities led to disease. If they sent poor people to America, those people could work and contribute to England's wealth. Otherwise, if they're living in an overpopulated city, they were simply a burden 
uh, to England. So why did the English colonists come to America? They came to gain economic independence. To have freedom to own their own land and to pass that land down to their children. This was their idea of freedom. In England, they didn't have that opportunity to own land. In order to own land in England, you had to inherit it. It was basically a two-tier system. The, there was the aristocracy and everyone else. And if you were part of the aristocracy, then you inherited land, therefore you owned land. But if you were not, then you had no opportunity to own land. And coming to America meant that you had that opportunity. Now the Chesapeake Colony. When I say the Chesapeake Colony, what I'm talking about is modern day Virginia and Maryland. But for the purposes of this lecture, I'm going to focus on Virginia, specifically Jamestown. Jamestown Colony was founded in 1608. It was founded by the Virginia Company by the authority of the Crown. So the English Crown gave authority to the Virginia Company to settle Jamestown. The Virginia Company was a private organization comprised of shareholders who were merchants, aristocrats, and members of Parliament. And the Crown granted these land char charters to the company. And the goal was to make money. The colony was also overseen by a governor. Initially, the colony consisted of mostly young English gentrymen who just wanted to look for gold. It consisted of very few farmers. The settlements were small. And in the beginning, there were about 400 settlers. And that was reduced to 65 after the first year due to starvation. And the reason they starved is because it was settled by very few farmers. The gentry did not know how to farm. That's not what their role was in England. So they didn't know how to uh, farm or, or really do any type of uh, self-sufficient work. They relied mostly on ships coming from England uh, to pr provide them food and sometimes those ships could take months uh, to get there and if they did arrive there were often uh, rotted food and, and so forth so um, it was a very tough time uh, early on in the Jamestown colony. Uh, John Smith was sent um, to lead the colony and so what he did um, is he went there and enforced labor in other words, he told them, you don't work, you don't eat. But he gets injured and returns to England. So the Virginia Company changes the plan because the settlement is clearly not working. So they decide to not rely on ships coming over and start to grow food. But they, what they realize early on is that they need to find a marketable good. And that good was tobacco. It was introduced by John Rolfe. Tobacco was the single most important fact in shaping Virginia's economy. It spread fast, so fast that it needed a labor system. Tobacco is a very intensive product 
uh, to plant. Um, it needs a lot of labor because it requires uh, a lot of work. So what they come up with is the headright system. And the headright system created large estates of tobacco. The way the headright system worked was that every colonist who paid for his own or another's passage to the colony would be awarded 50 acres of land. So that means if you brought a lot of servants or you paid a lot of passages uh, for servants to come and work the land, you could acquire a lot of land. And that's what happened. The estates were generally owned by sons of merchants and English gentlemen. Uh, they were basically owned by the aristocracy because most poor people couldn't afford uh, to pay for someone's passage or even their own. Just to give you an idea of what uh, the tobacco industry looked like here, is that in 1620, Virginia exported 4,000 pounds of tobacco. But by 1639, almost 20 years later, Virginia exported about 1.5 million pounds of tobacco. So who was this labor force? Their initial labor system consisted of indentured servants. And indentured servants were people who would sign contracts um, with the gentry or the aristocrats that guaranteed passage to America in exchange for room, board, and food. And their contracts varied. Uh, so it depend so it, it could vary anywhere from you get land um, after you work, uh, work these uh, acres of tobacco, or you could simply uh, just get passage and a salary of some sort. So it really kind of depended. But the average contract uh, looks like this. Um, at the end of the at the end of the term, they would get land to farm. So, in other words, they may sign a contract for uh, for a certain amount of years, um, usually four to five years, or until they were 24 years old. So, at the end of that, after the at the end of that term, then you would get a piece of land of your own. Most of the servants were single, poor, white, uh, and and men, and and uh, they were not only white, but they also had black indentured servants um, as well. So Virginia will become about 80 to 90 percent labor force, which were servants. So what you have here is a small group of people or a small amount of people owning a large amount of land. So the land, most of the land is held by very uh, few people, but a, but a very big uh, workforce. And women will not come to the colony um, till a little bit later. Initially, again, it was young uh, men, uh, generally white, and sometimes um, black as well. Now, this was not an easy life um, for the indentured servants. Um, this was a master-servant type of relationship. Uh, the work was backbreaking. It was dangerous. You're in a foreign environment, so you're uh, subject to diseases because you don't have an immunity system uh, for the environment that you're in. Uh, and they had to answer to a master. And they had to fulfill their term. There were punishments for those who tried to run away or tried to break their term. So why put up with this backbreaking, dangerous work? 
they did so um, because it was better than what they had in England. In England, they would always be poor. Remember, there was a two-tier system. It was either you were an aristocrat or you were a laborer. And you could only inherit land if you were an, uh, an aristocrat. So you were never going to have the opportunity to, uh, to uh, own land. But here, as an indentured servant, once you were done with your turn, you had that opportunity. So it was better than what uh, you were getting in England. And you also had an opportunity to pass that land on to your children, which is something you didn't have uh, an opportunity to do um, in England. And also, uh, servitude was normal in England, but it was lifetime servitude. In America, it would only be for a short term. So in the end, it was a good idea uh, for many, a good opportunity. When settlers come to America, they are going to encounter Indians, just like the Europeans, uh, such as uh, the Spanish, had done before. The Virginia settlers would encounter mostly the coastal Indians, specifically the Powhatan. Uh, the Powhatan was really more than just one tribe. It was basically kind of a a group of tribes, um, and it the the name of the different tribes was not called the Powhatan. Really, uh, the Powhatan tribe was named um, after the leader who was called uh, Powhatan. This was really named by the settlers. They had their individual names of tribes and 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 so forth. But uh, they will encounter um, this group of tribes, uh, the Powhatan. And there will be conflict um, with the Powhatan. Because what the coastal Indians were used to were Europeans coming uh, to the coast and simply trading. They were not used to Europeans making permanent settlements, uh, at least not on the coast uh, anyway. So this is going to create a conflict. And the colonists were taking a lot of the Powhatan's land. The English believed uh, in a legal doctrine called vacuum domicium. And it was really just a rationale for taking others' land. Uh, but it was, it was the basis for taking American or Native American land. And the view, the uh, doctrine said that if no one was occupying or using a piece of land, then you could take the land. And so that's what they did. And if you remember, I talked about the, the different views of land between Europeans and uh, Native Americans. And this uh, plays a role here. Because if you'll remember, the Native Americans saw land as more uh, community-based. Uh, they weren't always using the land. Uh, sometimes it was just used for uh, hunting. And so they would often uh, not be on the land. But the English believed in, you know, putting a fence up, putting a dwelling down, and now this is my land. Uh, so this is going to create a major conflicts um, with the Powhatan. Uh, so there's going to be an uprising in 1622 uh, by uh, Obakano. Um, he was Powhatan's brother and successor, so he took he takes over after Powhatan uh, leaves. And there was this uprising, but it failed. Uh, a number of Indians and settlers died, and in the end, uh, the Powhatan Indians um, uh, lost land. Uh, they signed a, a treaty with the colonists, uh, which forced... Uh, them to move west, away from uh, the English settlements. 
But after this uprising uh, in 1624, the Virginia Company would eventually give up its charter and become a royal colony and oversaw by a governor. Uh, what really happened here was that the idea of the Virginia Company was to make money and, and they were no longer uh, making money because uh, you had all these wealthy aristocrats owning all of this uh, land and it was no longer really making money for the company anymore so it eventually became uh, a royal colony. Bacon's Rebellion occurred because of a land dispute in the Jamestown colony. Governor Berkeley gave wealthy tobacco planters land grants on inland land and allotments. Those tobacco planters were getting the best lands, so freed indentured servants couldn't get land. They had to work as tenants on lands. This resulted in poverty for those freed servants. Those freed servants didn't have the right to vote because voting was tied to property ownership. The governor also had a relationship with the local Native Americans and therefore wouldn't allow settlement of their land by the colonists. In 1676, the impoverished whites began to have minor confrontations with those Native Americans. They wanted the Native Americans gone so more lands would be available for them. Governor Berkeley refused to do so, thus a rebellion ensued. The leader of the rebellion was Nathaniel Bacon, who was a wealthy planter, but didn't like Berkeley and his friends. Bacon and the rebels called for the removal of Native Americans they also wanted a reduction of taxes and to end this unfairness with respect to giving good lands to the tobacco planters. The rebels were small farmers, landless men, indentured servants, and some of those were uh, blacks. Most were recent servants. Bacon and his followers burned down Jamestown. Berkeley fled, and Bacon becomes Virginia's ruler until England sent its warship and then restored order. The end result was that taxes were reduced and more aggressive Indian policy was put in place. This policy opened western areas that had normally been given to Indians to small farmers. Bacon's Rebellion's historical importance is that it signified a shift from white indentured servants to African slaves. So in other words, there began to be a change from having indentured servants as a labor force and a movement towards African slaves. So why did this occur? Because the elite became fearful of an inter-civil war with small farmers. And also because of the elite's fear of an alliance of white and black servants. If you remember, the rebels were both black and white. So how did they do that? Well, they created laws that differentiated white servants from blacks and elevated white servants and poor whites over blacks. This created a better relationship between the white elites and the poor whites. So if they have a relationship, then they won't rebel on them again. 
And what this did is it created a superiority of whites to blacks and made that a commonality. So what it did is it elevated the status of the poor whites over blacks. They also did it by creating laws that controlled blacks. The House of Burgesses, which was their government uh, organization at the time, enacted what was called slave codes. Examples of slave codes were that slaves could be bought, sold, leased, and fought over in courts. So in other words, they were treated like property or chattel. Blacks and whites were tried in separate courts. No black, free, or slave could own arms, strike a white man, or employ a white servant. So if you'll see with that last one I just mentioned, it didn't matter if you were a free black or if you were a slave, you were treated the same with respect to the law. So as you can see, this creates a differentiation between whites and blacks. Other influences of this shift to African slave labor include the death rate of African slaves fell. So it was more economical to buy slaves. In other words, when for, uh, black slaves were first brought over, they uh, often died very early because they were not acclimated to the environment with diseases and such. But the longer they were here, the more acclimated they became. Uh, so uh, they were able to live longer. Because at the time, African slaves cost a lot of money. So if your slave died, that meant um, that you lost a great deal of money. So it just wasn't economically feasible for them to uh, purchase African slaves. But that changed. Also, the other, the other influence was that the Rural Africa Company's monopoly on the English slave trade ended. So anytime you have someone that has an, a monopoly on something, it means that they can charge higher prices because they're the only ones in the market and they can get away with it. But when you have other uh, slave traders in the market, then they have to drive their prices down. With respect to the developments in the Chesapeake, the cultural development included religion, which was a state-run church, and it was Anglican. The uh, Chesapeake was mostly made up of men. Women came later. Economically, the labor system moved from indentured servitude to slavery, and the primary crop, crop was tobacco. Politically, the Chesapeake Colony included a House of Burgesses, and the Chesapeake Colony implemented slave codes that separated the treatment of blacks and whites. Conclusions. There were conflicts between Indians and colonists because of colonist land encroachment, which resulted in the Indians' loss of land. And the Chesapeake's colonist idea of freedom is land, unlike the Indians' idea of freedom. This is reflected in their conflict with the Indians, and it will continue uh, to be a conflict. The big picture Racism against blacks in America is a byproduct of American slavery and the creation of the slave codes. You can see the origins of racism against blacks in those slave codes. So this is where it originates. And then next, America's economic system, which thrived through the 1800s, was initially built on the backs of slaves in the Chesapeake.
and we will continue to talk about the economic system. But it, it's initially uh, based on the backs of black slaves in the Chesapeake. Right, that ends this lecture. If you have any questions, please let me know.